I thought we should start maybe by just a very simple kind of definition of what continuity still is and why you were drawn to those photographic objects. Well, a continuity photograph is uh, a photograph that is taken uh, in the process of making a, a film to document uh, the scene, the set. So in case you need to go back and re-photograph, you know where stuff is. Uh, and sometimes uh, you know where, you know, how it was lit as well. Uh, the interesting thing about what drew me to some of these, well, mainly these photographs, was that uh, in the early 1930s, they made those photographs with 8x10 view cameras and made contact prints. Mm -hmm. So my first attraction to them was I just thought, wow, these are just beautiful prints. And it's a hell of a lot easier to buy this photograph than to make one. They're just, <laughs> you know. So I just started acquiring them just because I found them fascinating and beautiful. It was only much later that I sort of realized that maybe I could do something with them other than that. Now now you would use your iPhone, right, to yeah. take the photo, but back then the, the studio photographers, that's all they did all day, was photograph with those 8x10 view cameras, whoever was in the lab, that's what they all, did all day, and they were really good at it. Mm. Do, you, do you have a memory of when you kind of first came across them and how you started collecting them? I do. It's not very exciting memory, but um, I had thought that maybe I, I've always been really interested in in films and old films, and I think as a lot of people are. And I and at some point I thought, well, I I want to start kind of collecting photographs, and it's obviously like way before eBay or anything like that. And I thought, well, maybe I will look at Hollywood for maybe like signed photographs of stars or something. And so I, I, somebody directed me to this store. Um, it, it, on Hollywood Boulevard there was a flower shop and there was a sandwich board that, with a little arrow that said back lot books. And there was an alley uh, next to the flower shop. And you walk back that alley and there was a three car garage with the garage doors open mm -hmm. and tables with posters. And it was, a, and all, almost all of these photographs, but one, came from that place. And it was a guy named Doug Hart, who had worked for Warner Brothers, and all these photographs, but one. Actually, the one might be Warner Brothers, but I'm not sure. Um, the exception of the proofs of rule um, were there. And, and I, I said to Doug, hey, hey uh, do you have any photos? Uh, uh, look under the tables in the back. And, and there were some boxes and those, those 500 sheet 8 by 10 boxes. And there were tons of these photographs, and I just started going through them. First, I bought a few, and so I would just go back over and over and over. And pretty soon, you know, Doug got to know me and would just give me a stool, and I would sit there and go through hundreds of photographs and buy them by the bunch. And yeah. was there any logic to it, or you were just no logic whatsoever? Uh, just images I liked, and that's that's what sort of happened was that. Uh, I just found that I was buying strange things. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, it's obvious that I'm. It's obvious that I'm going to like like destruction, mm -hmm. right? So it's one of the first groups was broken furniture and evidence of aggression. But then I found that I was buying a lot of empty hallways, just <laughs> generic empty hallways, and I found that I was buying groups where where there would just be somebody on the set who didn't care because the photographer was just documenting it and the photographer didn't care because the person wasn't enough of a problem in terms of describing it. And I, I just was sort of found that I had categories. And I have to credit Judy Fiskin, who I was teaching with at CalArts at the time, who I was showing some of the work to, and she said, oh, you ought to do something with this. And so then I started screwing around, and I did the first four groups that are in that book over there, Continuity. And in, in looking for those, you you decided to show them in, what, the mid-90s, or was that, do you remember? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, the first time I showed them was at Patricia Four Gallery. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm trying to think what, probably the late 1980s. But uh, you can look at that book. Yeah, it has a date on it. Probably <laughs> 92 is the book, you know, I don't know. So yeah, late 80s, early 90s. 
Now, did, it's fascinating with the works, with these that you're finding, and you're finding them out in the world, and you're selecting, and you're making these things. There are these, these recurring themes. You mentioned kind of these hallways, these desolate spaces, these figures caught in those spaces. You know, and there's, to me, a lot of similarity between some of your series and the works you started doing in the 70s, um, Vandalized Spaces, the Zuma series. Did, was that conscious to you when you started to be like, okay, there's, there's a pattern here that speaks towards what I'm doing, or was it truly just kind of mana from heaven? Probably was not conscious initially. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, <laughs> there was a whole genre of quote-unquote art photography in the late 70s through the early 80s, which was called fabricated to be photographed. Mm -hmm. So I was in some of those shows, Robert Cumming was in some of those shows. So I think it's uh, fairly obvious that I would be interested in scenes that are fabricated to be photographed as, as these are. So in the, early, in the early 1930s, the film stock was very insensitive to light. So you had to build absolutely everything that you wanted to photograph. Even, even a generic hallway, you couldn't just go find a hallway, you had to build one without a ceiling so you could flood it with light. Mm -hmm. So certainly it began to dawn on me. I don't think initially I, I thought about it, but uh, which most, most things I do work that way, that I have a kind of intuitive initial kind of response to something and do something that way, and then later, uh, fabricated theory that fits the evidence and that kind of helps going forward um, yeah so yeah so I, I, I got very interested in that idea that they were completely constructed and I got interested in the idea that uh, you know it, it's like it starts out with a story right somebody writes a story about something that somebody in Hollywood decides they want to buy that story and make it as a film and then an art director reads that story and interprets what the scenes of that story might look like. And then the studio car carpenters sort of build the set. And then, uh, you know, then somebody lights it. Who, and then the uh, studio photographer pho photographs it. And then I contextualize the photographs in a different way. So there's, there's a whole chain of problematic authorship through the whole thing. I, I love it in... in the works that you are drawn to for these groupings, how they can look almost like a reality. They look kind of clear. They look like a kind of room or normal banal setting. But there's just something slightly askew. If it's a clapperboard or if it's just the edge of a set light or something. And I'm wondering in making this selection from your archive, if that's something you kind of purposely go for the kind of almost reality, or is there a logic there that's also kind of you're playing with? You're, you're giving me way, way more credit for intentionality <laughs> than I actually have. Again, in retrospect, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested, let's see, ask me that question one more. <laughs> I'm just, I, I really love, you know, I think it's interesting in comparison to, to, to Robert Cummings' work that there, there are these moments where it's, it's very clearly the artificial is on full display. And so, you know, if you look at a piece like that where you see this um, uh, from the studio Still Life uh, work where you have this backdrop and it's hanging and it's very clear, you, you in these images are drawn to something that's a little more discreet. It, well, well, yeah, I guess you're talking about the uncanny. Yeah. Essentially, um, yeah. and again, it, like when I acquired them, oh, how uncanny this is! I mean, I wasn't saying that to myself. In, in retrospect, certainly, I'm interested in that artificiality, like like all the the, the on the back corner, on the back wall there, all the all these basically place settings mm. of you know that are designed to represent a certain uh, kind of narrative of. You know, whether it's a picnic, or whether it's a rich person's table, or whether it's World War One, or, you know, I, I just like the way it fits into and represents a kind of larger, completely fictive and constructive narrative. Yeah. And then how those play off of one another. Um, and I just like the way they look. Definitely. 
Yeah, you have this great line when you, in uh, the continuity book, um, where you talk about a kind of uh, a, a fiction, a construction of a fiction of normal life. And I really liked that idea in relationship to these. Yeah, that almost needs to go back, you know, to my fundamental interest in photography. Mm. It's like I, I, I have this sort of conviction that the invention of photography was this really significant, like amazingly significant step in cultural evolution. And that, you know, and then the, the sort of mechanisms for the dissemination of those images are, are kind of incrementally sort of bring us to the point where we are now where it's ubiquitous. But I'm just, I'm sort of interested in, you know, it, it's like if, if you think about Los Angeles, you have an image in your head in Los Angeles, a sense of what it is. I've lived in Los Angeles my entire life. And I can't differentiate what that image in my head of this place is, the, the difference, what comes from, from direct experience and what comes from mediated experience, seeing it in the background of commercials or seeing it as the ground for a film or seeing it in advertising. So I've seen literally millions and millions of representations of this place. And what interests me is not only that my sense of place, in places I've never been, I have a, a sense, but what's really interesting is it never occurs to me to interrogate the difference. It never, it's a tapestry of, of direct experience and representational experience, but it never, occur, it, it never occurs to me to interrogate what's, what comes from what. I just accept it as reality. And so I, I sort of see these as a kind of weird foundational uh, kind of manifestations of that in a more narrow sense. Yeah, a kind of space to explore that idea of a kind of fabricated version of representations of a yeah, it just, you know, it's like I love the hats, like, you know, the cowboy hat, and there's a Zorro hat, and yeah. you know, all these, and it's just that one little signifier carries a whole set of baggage and belief systems that were, you know, addressed in that film and so Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so interesting because you can do that with any image, but in, in this case, you know, the clues are really purposefully placed because there's a narrative there, as you mentioned, like, Within the time, the the settings, you know, you, you you read into that, and you can get a full story. Well, I'm so that to that point, I mean, I'm interested in like beyond these works, how the idea of Hollywood has played into your work, and how you kind of a, approach it, and what what is Hollywood in relationship to your own work? That's a broad question. <laughs> Well, I grew up, I was born in Venice, California, but my parents moved to the West San Fernando Valley uh, to a place called Hidden Hills when I was seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hidden Hills was a, a very early gated community, it was its own city, uh, but all the people there didn't have any money. So the whole time I lived there until I was 16, nobody ever was at the gate. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and now, like, all really rich people live there, but uh, and they do have a guy at the gate because he wouldn't let me in to see my old house. Get out of here! Uh, but anyway, uh, right across the uh, what was now the 101 freeway, which was a two-lane road at the time when I was a kid, uh, was the Fox Movie Ranch. So I would sneak in there when I was a kid into the Fox Movie Ranch, and there was a guy that would chase us in a pickup truck, and <laughs> you could hear him coming. So we did actually even make noise so he would chase us. And there was also an adobe uh, there called the Leonis Adobe. Now it's which uh, John Carradine lived in with his kid, Keith Carradine oh, wow. and David Carradine. And I, I never met them, but I went in there after they left. And there was a, a you know, and across the street from me, a, 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 one of the dead end kids, a guy named Leo Gorsi lived. So it was kind of all around me. And then, uh, so, you know, in the 50s and 60s, Hollywood was one of the main industries of Southern California, and it wasn't very diverse, and then aerospace became kind of a bigger industry. And then when I moved to Venice, uh, I came across the old MGM back lot, 
and yeah. I photographed there. And then I photographed the last season of the X-Files. Uh, uh, I, I got permission. One of my ex-graduate students, I ran into her. And I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm art director on the X-Files. Oh, OK. Uh, can you get me in? Because <laughs> I was trying to do a body of work about uh, miracles. Like, just I wanted to go a place where it's completely generic, but a miracle happened there. But that's tough in the United States, because they built a statue there now. Like if Joseph Smith saw something, there's a statue. So, and I didn't, didn't have the money to go to Europe. I thought maybe there'd be more there. But I thought, well, X-Files, that's kind of like that, right? It's like space <laughs> aliens and people that internally combust. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just do the X-Files instead. When you were <laughs> photographing the X-Files, did you think of yourself as taking on the role of one of these continuity photographers? Was that like present in your mind? No. Yeah. I just thought, it's fabricated to be photographed. You know, the same with Robert Cohen. Yeah. Here, it's like, you know, you can see why a person that has this kind of practice of building things to photograph is going to be just naturally drawn to a, a whole kind of world that is built for the camera. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, one thing I've noticed in comparison of these works is that, you know, okay. if, 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 Robert Cumming is really being drawn to this kind of idea of sculpture that I think is also is really present in yours. I think of yours as really being tied into to performance, that in these continuity stills, there's so much um, kind of remnants of action left. Um, so that there's almost like kind of a ghostly presence where they, they function almost like evidence photographs. Yeah, no, I, I, well, I think you're right about some of the photographs are about formal and sculptural ideas and other photographs are about, in a very distant way, images within images. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the subvert, it, it, I don't know if you had one other question about humor at all. But every once in a while, people tell me my photographs are funny. Mm -hmm. And I was watching the, uh, the film mm -hmm. Noah made. Is there a quote of Robert coming about humor in, in, in the film? Because there is, a, I saw an interview with him where somebody asked him about it. He said, oh, I didn't want him to be funny. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is something about, um, you know, when you tell a joke, the, uh, you know, your mind runs ahead. And and all of a sudden something happens within your expectations of you're kind of running ahead of this narrative is completely unexpected. Like a word that in that context should mean one thing suddenly means another and you laugh. And, uh, and often you see a car crash and you might laugh just because it's equally unexpected. So I think this idea of wanting to find a rupture in a kind of expectation mm -hmm. is something that a studio lot provides in spades, right? And, and I think it's also, if you look at the, the work that he, his other work, it's often about sort of finding the intersection of two different kinds of vocabularies, whether it's like cursive writing that is then made sculptural, or whether it's kind of the marks of rain that you would make on a cartoon made literal and physical, in the world that this, these kinds of ruptures of expectations. And uh, I don't see that in this body of work of mine, but I see that in a lot of my work. Is ruptures that, of expectations. Yeah, well, or intersections of, of hopefully previously not intersected vocabularies. So, yeah. yeah. Could you talk about maybe in what kind of works, what series you see that? For me? Yeah. Uh, Uh, in all, it's all of it. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, what I'm doing now, I, I kind of go into abandoned houses. I've uh, been working in abandoned Air Force Base. And, you know, one thing I use is I use color flash. So I mix the color blue for my flash with the, the warm available light. So that is subtle, but it is unexpected. It's not, it's not a neutral rendition. Or I take like I've been generating images out of AI, and I put them up in the rooms, and they're not what you would expect to find in that room. And 
and maybe the vocabulary of the representations within that AI-generated image might subvert an expectation in some way. So, I, but I think that's almost all artists are screwing around with that in some way. But I think in Cummings, where you know you got this guy on a boat, you know, right? You know, in, it's like just a reasonable kind of idea. But there's something about him being six feet off the ground. That's funny, <laughs> yeah. right? But but I don't think he wants it to be funny. I think he wants it to be have that hum of expected and not expected or recognized, but something's not quite right yeah. in a way. And the same, and I think I have the same thing with the set stills where it's totally familiar. You know, get back to the uncanny, right? Yeah, yeah. But somehow too perfect. Yeah. yeah. What is it? You, you, I'm fascinated by within your work and in relationship to these works, um, before we, I want to talk more about Robert, um, this idea of uh, uh, the abandon as a subject. Um, I was wondering what, what do you think, you, you've worked in so many abandoned spaces in MGM studios, you're working with these pieces, these photographs that in many ways were abandoned. What do you, what do you think draws you to the abandoned as a kind of space? Well, I mean, initially it was entirely practical. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, you know, it, it actually started in a, a really kind of uninteresting way, which was that I was photographing with a 35 millimeter camera and went out and photographed some silver butane tanks. And there's something about silver and a silver gelatin print that's not quite gray. It's like, it actually is silver. And I thought, well, that, that looks interesting. But this is really a boring photograph of a butane tank. So I thought, well, I could just buy some more spray paint, spray paint anything I wanted. And I started driving around. And you can't just paint anything you want. It all belongs to people. <laughs> and uh, so I found that, uh, oh, there's an abandoned house. I could go in there and start spray painting things silver. So it really was kind of one thing led to another. But now, uh, it is, you know, at the time, I didn't have the money for a studio. You know, had I been, had I had any money, I might have ended up being a different kind of artist because I would have a studio where I could make things and photograph them, but I didn't. So I worked in abandoned places. And then I got to really liking two things about it. The first thing I like about it is that most people's houses are just like everybody else's house. Like you go into anybody's bathroom, it's kind of pretty much like everybody else's bathroom. Front, you know, stucco walls, at least in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this kind of psychological ground that's familiar to everybody. And, you know, the second thing, I lost my train of thought. The second thing I like about it, I hope we're going to catch up, <laughs> um, is, okay, uh, the second thing I like about it is that if it's been abandoned for a while, it is, uh, it is, there's these layers of gestures that are obvious in it. We, we, you know, initially there's the gesture of the architect that designs it. Then there's the gesture of the people that live there who might put up wallpaper or whatever they did. Then like the place I'm photographing now, there's the gesture of the meth addicts that come in and break wall, holes in the wall to look for copper. Then there's a gesture of the guys with paintball guns, like to having war games. Then there's the gesture of other people like me with spray cans spraying in there. And so there's all these layers of gesture that I can appropriate in some way. And I've been working in this abandoned Air Force Base now for nine years. And I'll walk into a room and I will have painted in that room five years ago. And so I'm part of that that history of that space, and I can approach, you know, the other thing about like why I started photographing in abandoned houses is like the time, which was the early 1970s, and I was in Los Angeles, and I saw no original art. You know, we didn't have a museum of contemporary art. I, I only saw magazines, or when I was in college, I saw slides projected on walls, and I just began thinking that well, you know, everything's fabricated to be photographed. It's just the painters and sculptors don't know it. And I backed off from that a little, but that, that was the idea I, I was kind of thinking. It's like, well, why would I paint on canvas when I can just paint on a wall or what? And somebody's going to photograph it. You know, it like, 
So I just thought, well, this way of working, it's like I can just, I can be so completely promiscuous in terms of appropriating sculptural vocabularies, painting vocabularies, performance vocabularies. I, I can, uh, and, and I've always uh, held on to that idea of just being promiscuous in terms of you know, something will say interesting or so, some phrase sounds interesting, paint it on the wall, see what happens. You know, uh, there, you know, there's no, now with digital, zero cost, you know, just push the button and move on. I, I think it might be important to kind of return. I want to kind of go back to this, ask a question about how this show came together. I realize we went off on a journey to talk about abandonment and all these different things, but I, I, I'm really curious what, how this show came together and your kind of response to this work by Robert Cumming. Well, the, the show was not my idea, it was Teresa's idea. <laughs> uh, so she's the one to ask. Uh, but I, I was on board immediately. I thought, oh, great, you know, I could show some of these things that I have. And I, I love Robert Cummings' work. I met Robert back when I was teaching extension at UCLA, and I didn't know him well, but he actually gave me a couple of these photographs. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I taught a class for him, and he, he gave me a couple. So. And, and I'm just interested in him as an artist, and so the chance of digging through this work and making a selection was very attractive to me. Uh, so that's how it really came about. I, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm unlikely to go back and propose older work of mine, even though some of these are, are newer uh, put together, but I'm so engulfed in what I'm doing presently that it wouldn't normally occur to me, but I'm absolutely delighted to do it. And with this selection, so maybe we can give some context to this. Um, this is a work called Studio Still Lives by Robert Cumming, and it was uh, a work he made in the late 70s on the invitation of uh, Al Dorskin. Did you, did you know Al Dorskin, by the way? Yeah. Al, Al Dorskin was the head of, uh, was an executive at Universal Studios and MCA. He's also the inventor, really, of uh, the Universal Studios tour. Um, uh, he saw an opportunity to make money of having tourists come on off-peak hours and do that. But he was also an avid photography collector and hit collector, and his collection was really kind of uh, was donated to LACMA and became the kind of core and the founding collection that that made LACMA's photo collection. Um, and he invited uh, Robert to photograph on the back lot. They had met because. Um, Robert was teaching and Al Torskin took a class with him. But he also invited Anthony Friedkin and Jerry Olsman. I know those are the other ones. But Jerry Olsman? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Though I don't know if that work is really, I know LACMA has that work. I've seen but a couple of the Tony Friedkin ones, but I've never seen those. Yeah, they're, one. they're buried in LACMA's archive, actually. Is it a combine damage? It's funny that you see him making the attempts of that. So it's actually really weird because there's a lot of it is like shots of the psycho house, right. like a lot of photographs. And then they have almost kind of contact sheets of the psycho house. Mm -hmm. So he, I think I'm not exactly sure if he did anything with them, but I know that they were there. Speaking of jokes, he's a really funny guy. Jerry Oldsman. I went on a hike, I, I, but I, I, but I, but, uh, <laughs> I went on a high country backtrack with backpack trip with him that the Yosemite Museum sponsored when they had a museum, and he told jokes the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I digress. It's it? uh, it's all about it. um, so I'm 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 curious with you. So you made a selection from this the portfolio of the the Studio Still Lives is 25 photographs, but then he took hundreds of photographs with an eight by ten, and I'm I'm interested in what drew you to this selection. Well, just as I indicated with my own work, nothing intentional. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I liked uh, certain images, and and I began to recognize sort of what he's looking at. I mean, there's a whole range of things. I mean, some are about, again, the uncanny notion of 
it's hard to do this not looking at the image. Uh, the uncanny notion of an image within an image, a, la a fictive landscape and a literal landscape, or how the people populate that kind of space. Uh, but then there's an awful, there's a number of images that I can identify very much. You said sculptural. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of images that, you know, in, in photo lingo you would call formal or about not simply the shapes, lines, and tones of the two-dimensional piece of paper that ends up, but the literal kind of sculptural material, abstract nature of stuff on the ground. Like this one right here with a broken chair. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it's like you can totally, almost any photographer would associate you like say, oh, okay, I would take that photo. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, like the, the guy on the boat, you know, how can you not choose that photo because it's so idiosyncratic and odd. Yeah. So there's all different reasons. And then, you know, the challenge is, okay, I gotta select a certain number of these photographs and you don't wanna just make them all the same. So it's this challenge of trying to balance out the range of approaches that you see within the aggregate, like archive of what you can look through. Um, so it's it's more that, uh, and uh, yeah. So that's it. You, you mentioned that you'd met kind of coming. You knew him a little bit, and then he gave you some of these pieces. Yeah. Did you guys ever talk about the series or anything? No, no. I, I, it was, I was teaching UCLA Extension, he was teaching UCLA Extension, and, and it was, it, I didn't know him well. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working, that's the reason I thought it was earlier, I was working in a, you know, one of the first jobs I got out of graduate school was, was uh, working at a kind of terrible photo lab at uh, it's La Brea and Slauson, and uh, it's called A&G Photo. And uh, it was a place that people would send in rolls of 120 film, and for very little money, you'd get these five by five prints back. And I would sit and watch, they would come out of the processor on a roll, and you'd watch it be somebody's birthday, it would be some bad like studio photography, and then we'd this somebody's trip. And they would like do the color balance, they would like write what's wrong with it, throw it in the trash. So I started collecting all these kind of. And I shared those with him, he loved those. He was like, He's found photos. Yeah, yeah, he, he was totally into those. And, and, uh, and, but I didn't really get to see my, any of the stuff he's doing. In yeah. fact, I'm not even sure I knew what he was doing. I probably, again, it's so long ago, I, did, I don't remember what I knew and what I didn't know, but I taught a class for him. And uh, so he gave me a couple of photos of my reputants. It's wild because he was collecting continuity stills in the 70s probably around the same time you started collecting. He, he, well, started he was doing collecting. it in the 70s, he was doing it for me. But to tell you the truth, it's only this year I even figured that out he collected them. Yeah. 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 I, I love this, there's a story that he would, um, he was teaching in Irvine and then he was also teaching in Los Angeles and so to kill time, he would go to memorabilia shops as well and just start collecting continuity stills and right. they were very much guiding a lot of his practice as well. Okay. You know, like I said, I, I didn't know. The nice thing about the place I've got most of them was that he was so relaxed. I tried to go to some of the other shops, yeah. and they would like sit and watch you, you know, as you <laughs> like went through a box of them, and, like sort of made you feel nervous. So, but he would be like, yeah, take him outside, sit on a stool, you know, spin as long as you want. Well, it's so interesting, this material of like, you know, so I'm, I'm as you know, and I, I work at the Academy Museum and we have, you know, I think I found out, I might have told you that like MGM donated their photo collection to the Academy and there's like 600 boxes of continuity reference photography for sex. <laughs> so there is more photographs than... Um, but these ones are the most beautiful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Our brothers did a better job than MGM yeah. and the quality of it. One of the things I talk about, again, I'm going to divert. Yeah, um, please. The MGM had these great, uh, what do you call it? You know, the, the 8 by 10 uh, contact print frames mm. that put the date on every print. So it'll say, you know, April 14th, 1932, and it'll say exactly what day every one of the images is shot on. 
and and you know there's this thing about indexicality in photography. It's you know it's it's a literal imprint of it from a time, place, and circumstance. And of course these photographs, uh, nobody's interested in that, right? It's like they're they're fictive, uh, they're fictive uh, narratives, and they're you know it could be 1840, it could be 1910, it you know. Uh, but I'm interested in them yeah. as indexical as being 1932 or 1933, as being a kind of emblematic of a, a particular time and circumstance. So you know, that's another variation. Did you, uh, you mentioned that you kind of, with these contact, uh, I mean these uh, uh, continuity stills, you, you, you've, these were made by craftspeople. These are beautiful objects. In your time studying with them and really collecting them, have, have you learned anything about these photographers, both like who they were and also maybe just about their process? I, I nothing about the process. I don't know anything other than that their paper was way better than the paper I had access to <laughs> when I was making prints. I don't know what the difference is, but you know, that, that's a beautiful paper. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, uh, I used to go to uh, memorabilia shows, you know, they would have kind of like a, at the Roosevelt Hotel, they'd have like a, they would show films and have a kind of a room full of stuff. So I bought stuff from other places, and I bought photographs of some of the photographers. There's photographs of the photographers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but again, these, there's no way to know yeah. uh, who, like when I did the book, I put the name of the art director. Uh, mm -hmm. In you know, in in, the, in with the information of like who the director was, who the art director was, the year, because obviously there's a level of authorship in terms of the art direction, but I there's no way for me to know the individual photographers. Mm -hmm. But I do have a bunch of photographs of people that worked as photographers in the studios. So that's great. Yeah. Well, maybe we can open it up to some questions if you're open for that, and we can talk about. Oh, Your work, well, Robert's work. Let's start it with, yeah, David. Um, John, I've got just because of the film stills. Did you have any interest ever in the moving image and making films, making videos, or was that not ever part of your interest? I just shot video the other uh, two days ago out of George Air Force Base. I bought like a cool little video camera, and the impetus there is some. I read somewhere that currently 80% of what's on the internet is video, which sort of shocked me. And then I was thinking, you know, pretty soon still photographs are just going to look like dead video, <laughs> you know, in another 10 years or whatever. So maybe I ought to start screwing around with it. But uh, early on, I did fantasize about making film, you know, that we had these huge old video cameras you know, you could take out from school, like a big tape. And, and, and I thought about film, but again, I had zero money. And I'm not the best collaborator. <laughs> you know? so, so it was pretty clear that, that you know, to really make a film, you have to be a person that can work with other people and, and be collaborative. In fact, they asked me uh, to review, this was years ago, UC Santa Cruz was going to have a new digital program. Uh, and their, their graduate program was all collaborative. Like you would come in, they put you together with a group of other people, you would, have a, uh, you would have to think up something to do and you would work together because, you know, a video game or whatever that stuff is, is requires collaboration. One person couldn't do it, although now probably could. But my comment was, what about the alienated loner that wants to do technology precisely because they don't have to collaborate? And they didn't like my <laughs> Question back. Um, when you did look at the continuity photos, would you ever like recognize that the films like that the pictures were from or pick things that had not only like visual associations but like, oh I remember this movie or like well, well, or no, they we have to be things you weren't familiar with? There almost none of them I was familiar with, although so well I take it back. Public Enemy, I think, was the one film that I'd probably seen. But there were films that had names that I recognized, like Maltese Falcon, House of Wax. But then I realized that I had seen the second, you know, like the Humphrey Bogart 
film is the second Maltese Falcon, not the first. And the same thing with House of Wax, like Vincent Price film is not the first one, those early 30s ones. So all of, a lot of those films were remade. And of course, later I get the Criterion Channel and I, I look at a lot of these films. And I have some really beautiful set stills from the films in Bengali, which uh, is, uh, in, the sets are incredible. They, they had an art director, uh, some of these are from him, a guy named Anton Grot, who was a German Expressions painter that was brought over to, to work at Hollywood, and undulating walls and all this stuff. And that film, the greatest sets, and then, you know, it's slightly creepy. Svengali looks like kind of an Eastern European, and all the, the good people are kind of British, and very white. And, you, and then you read, read about after it, the, like the book was very racist. It was anti-Semitic, and Svengali was Jewish, you know. So that's why nobody's ever seen that film since. It, it wasn't a criterion channel. Uh, so I go back and look at the films. I, I, I do enjoy going back and looking. Though, but uh, they're not something I had run into very often, uh, like I said, but I think with the exception of Public Enemy. But uh, I've got great Maltese Falcon monster, Sam Spade's kitchen, Sam Spade's office. Hmm. Any more questions? Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> so you were working at the Air Force Base for quite some years. Yeah, it'll be 10 yeah. in January, four or five. Yeah. You find your work is changing from trespass to permission? Uh, is it change of trespass to permission? Uh, only in that I can be way more efficient with permission. Uh, especially when I'm shooting with 8x10 view camera. It's like if, if I didn't have permission, which I didn't most of the time early on, um, you have to hide your car. So you got, you got, because they're never going to catch you because you could hear them coming. So, but you have, they'll find your car. So you have to hide your car. <laughs> and there's only certain places you can hide your car. And then it's a long hike to maybe where you want to photograph. So it was, it was, it was or, and if you forgot anything, tough luck, you know, you're like, no, just drag that big camera, like, all over the place. But now you can pull right in front of a building you want to work in. And, uh, mm -hmm. So it's way more efficient. Uh, and, uh, yeah, less nerve-wracking, you know, not listening quite as hard, you know, for, for the guard. The guards recognize you now? They do you? now. Yeah. 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 Well, I used to run the same guy who kicked me out of all that, caught me without permission. And, and why the hell are you still photographing here? Like, you know, like, years later, he's like looking around, everything's ruined, you just can't figure out why. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you know. Does he get a sense to you explain yourself as an artist? Like, like no, no. Artist. The only reason I have permission is professor. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, I teach at the University of California. I'm a professor. And, oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not supposed to, even with permission, I'm supposed to go in the buildings. Really? Yeah. 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 So, uh, in fact, I always was worried they would Google me. <laughs> and it would be totally over. He's a professor of art. <laughs> I don't even, I don't think I care about professor. It's a, it's a good license, you know, to do stuff. Yeah, in the back. You say you're incorporating AI into some of your latest work in that same progression. What's the part that scares you the most and intrigues you the most about that vision? What's that scares me the most about AI? About the AI. Uh, I don't think I'm particularly scared about AI, except, you know, the scenario, the Terminator scenarios, and, you know, stuff like that. But I don't think I'll live to see that. So it's the rest of your problem. <laughs> but uh, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, years ago, I did a body of work called Seven Songbirds and a Rabbit. And I had used uh, photographs from the Keystone Mass Collection at the, at the University of Riverside, where I teach, uh, which are the 3D stereo negatives from mainly 19th century, but early 20th century. And I did this body of work uh, where I, I, you know, I did this so long ago, I had to make copy negatives from the glass stereo negatives. And I did seven songbirds and a rabbit on this material called photographic linen. Um, and, you know, really nice kind of walnut frames. And I thought, well, I, I, maybe I want to redo that. And so I started uh, doing prompts with the songbirds. And man, the AI and 
10 seconds makes the most beautiful songbird. You know, and you know, and it really quite nice. And then you notice that the front of the songbird has this beautiful soft light on it, like very subtly illuminated. And you know that, well, the AI doesn't know what it's doing, but it's, it's grinding through the thousands and thousands of photographs and drawings of songbirds that people have edited by these very subtle kind of variations. And then it can pick that up and, and that that's, so this idea, you know, was Carl Jung with the collective unconscious, you know, I get that this idea that this externalized collective consciousness is just wickedly interesting. I mean, it has it's all, all kinds of problematics about it, huh? but as, as, a, as, a, as a phenomenon, I think it's, uh, you know, if I were 20 years old and an artist, I think I'd be thinking about where that's going and what that is and what that does and how it does it. Um, yeah. yeah, I also did uh, Ted Kaczynski with rabbits. Uh, you know, Ted Kaczynski's the Unabomber, right? And, uh, you know, he killed two people. I don't want to valorize Ted Kaczynski, but here's a guy just literally goes insane over anxiety about technology, right? And, and, uh, and I think there's this pervasive general cultural anxiety about it. You know, and I have it and everybody has it. And like smartphones, you know, it's like, I went into, I, I'm teaching an advanced photo class right now, and we took a break and I came back in. Every single person in that room was looking at their soft, their, their, their smartphone. I think there's simple one. And, and I, well, it used to be those people wouldn't be talking to one another. They would get to know one another, but they're not, because they're all looking at their phones. And, and that's something to be concerned about. You know, I, it's, you know, it, but there is, so I'm interested in that general cultural anxiety that goes with it as an artist. I, you know, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not going to write a treatise about it. But I'm, I'm thinking, like, well, how can I manifest that and so on? It's interesting in what you talked about with the AI. And then also, it makes me think about this. You mentioned this. That we talked about this idea of the construction of a ficti fictitious version of normal. Right. And that in some ways that's what it's doing too. That's what these people are doing right. too. There's this whole construction there. Right, right. And it's, uh, like I said, I, I think just the, the evolution of the, the pervasiveness of the internet and, and scrolling and how it's, you know, it's always been the case that, you know, all these ads you watch on television, it's like, Almost none of these people have a specific ideology other than to get you to look and to sell you something. It's like they're not, you know, they don't have, for the most part, a specific political agenda. And, and, but the mechanisms by which they can focus on what we want and what we look at, it gets per incrementally more and more and more refined so that you know, it's getting to a very scary kind of point now where, you know, in some way it's just a, a general indictment of all of us and what we want to look at. But by the same token, it's, it's just uh, to disengage is kind of almost impossible. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, one more question. Yeah. So I'm interested in the concept of continuity, not just in the way that it's rendered through these images, but like, when you think about like continuity in the context of everyday life, there's a certain kind of labor associated with continuity. Like I used to be a high school teacher, and when I would walk in the classroom at the beginning of the day, like the carpet was always clean, and at the end of the day there was like gum and shreds of paper, and then you walk in the next day and it's clean again, right? And there's this element of continuity that's like central just to living your life day to day, right? Uh, and so I'm wondering, like, in the context of thinking about continuity with labor. Like, are these photographs largely taken by anonymous people, or are these like, would the studios employ like steadily one or two photographers? Was it steady employment, or was it just like freelance work? What kind of labor conditions were these people working under? Well, the honest answer is I've got no idea. <laughs> uh, I have assumptions. I, uh, I mean, the, the studios work industry, and you know they have, you know, the, the sound stages were continuous 
probably under operation. <laughs> I assume that they're staff. And we're probably paid just like all the other grips and carpenters. And, and there probably wasn't much differentiation. But again, I'm just guessing. Uh, I assume it's probably a better job than most, but I'm not sure. 1932, <laughs> what was going on at the studios. David. Just to your question, um, Robert told us when he did the photographs in 77, there were three full-time professional photographers that were employed by Universal, they were all Teamsters. They were completely freaked out that he was there. He had to hide all the time, his problems. But they were professional photographers employed by the studio. The agreement was they were not allowed to credit, and they had credit for any work that they did. And the Teamsters contract with them is that they didn't do headshots. They did no um, celebrity. They did only, you know, continuity back a lot, documents and stuff. But there, at that point, there were three professional photographers employed by the studio just to do stills. And then I think for the 30s and 40s, yeah, it, it, it would have been, as you said, just like the camera department, the art department, very much anonymous, very much a factory, part of pumping this out. And you know, so much of the studio system is modular and they reused, and so it's just about this machine. Great, well, with, with, with that, oh wait, we got one more. I'm gonna do in the back. Yeah, um, so I remember years ago, I came across a book of uh, William Edelson's photographs, and in this book, there were also doodles that he had done with partners, which I had never seen before, but I remember it suddenly like gave me a different way to like, consider his color photography. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have any like artistic hobbies, or you might not like describe those practice, so to speak, but were you engaged in, you know, some kind of like creative uh, output other than the clock? No. <laughs> 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 the photography is kind of it for me. It's all yeah. Well, breaking uh, and entering. I never break an enter. <laughs> I, I really have a rule. If somebody is really, really serious about keeping me out, I stay out. Like, you know, I'm not going to climb a fence or cut a hole in a fence or yeah. kick in the door if it's locked. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, but if there is a hole in the fence. But there's a hole in the fence. Yeah. Yeah. And they haven't fixed it. Yeah. It's their fault. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I often think, like, I go out all the time to photographs. Yeah. And I, 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 it's like, a lot of people my age go out and play golf. Me, I say, oh, the weather's not, I get in my car, I go drive 58 miles to the place I photograph, and I interact there for about three hours, and, and I just enjoy it. I mean, I just, it is, all the other things that have to do with being an artist, I don't enjoy so much. I don't like the computer work all that much. I don't like dealing with trying to get the work out into the world. I don't even like exhibitions and books all that much, but I really do like going out and photographing. And the place I am photographing has 600 separate buildings. So every building is slight differently, different orientation of the sun. So I can go from building to building and the light is coming in those buildings in, in different ways. The interiors are different, you know, different things are in there. And it's just, um, yeah, it, I just it flat out enjoy it and way, way, way more photographs than a human needs to have in a body of work. Uh, and uh, so, but I just keep doing it because I like doing it. And if I find something else that I like that much, I'll do that, but I haven't yet. I think that, oh, but we, we got one more, yeah. Um, how do you feel about um, Todd Heido's work his interiors, which seem influenced by a lot of what you've done over time and the recognition he's getting lately. I don't, I, I probably don't know his interior. I mean, I just, I does the beautiful young women in interiors, those? No, he does, well, he does exteriors at night. Yeah, those are Interiors I of. Yeah, of he enemies. shoots through his windshield. Yeah, that too. Right, right. Uh, well, I like that work. I mean, I like the, the, the exterior night thing shooting through the windshield. Uh, I kind of liked at one point that it was all kind of analog, like his color palette and he was using analog. I thought he was very good at that. Um, 
I don't know the interiors. I don't think so. I, I, I can't possibly have an opinion about it. But, uh, it's similar. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Damn him. <laughs> I had one, one, one final question for myself, which is that, like, so when you, when you were doing Zuma, you photographed until that building burned down right. and was destroyed. With, with the project you're working right now, with the base, the air base, do you have a cap on that yet, or you're just going? No, no. I, 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 if I, you'd have told me I'd still be working on it, I'd have said you're insane. Yeah. You know, we would keep working there that long. I kind of sometimes wish it'd just be torn down. I show up one day. And that's a, well, the thing is that I, I've changed technology through it, and I've changed different approaches, and then the AI stuff. So it seems like I just keep figuring out a new way to deal with it. Because it's like somebody built it for me. Mm -hmm. There was a science fiction book I read when I was a teenager, and uh, I can't, I can never find the name of it again. And it was like this planet that the entire planet had been built on. So it was like a, a shell all the way around the planet. And people from other planets would go to that planet, and they were all archaeologists that so would dig down into that planet to see if they could figure out the history of the civilization. And it turns out at the end of the book, the whole thing had been built just to, to, to entertain the, the, the smartest people in that culture to keep them from figuring out what was really going on. But I, I sort of sometimes feel that way. That, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> that it's constructed for you. The crust. Yeah. 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 I love that. Um, well, I, I, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been really thank a pleasure. You. Thank and, you. And, and thank you all for coming. This is not easy.